And what I'm going to share with you, I think, could be the most important message I've ever shared with pastors in my life. Because I'm going to share with you about dealing with a spirit that is trying to kill you. Literally trying to kill you. And uh, I'm going to share with you from the scripture, but from my own experience. Uh, uh, a few, uh, last year when I was at Hillsong, um, I, I spoke at Hillsong, did their staff thing and, and their, their retreat, their Kingdom Builders retreat, and then spoke in the church, and then flew to New Zealand, and Brian flew with us, and we did a conference there. Well, before I was in Australia, we were you know, at the ART conference. If you've never been to the ART conference, it's a great conference. It's coming up, I think, in April. It's at Dino Rizzo's church. They're hosting it, and next year, we're hosting it here. ARC is Association of Related Churches, Rick Bizet, um, Chris Hodges, Joe Champion, Dino Rizzo, Stovall Wings, um, Greg Surratt, those guys, and Billy Hornsby. By the way, most of you, some of you have asked me, Billy Hornsby uh, is uh, very close to going to be with the Lord. If the Lord doesn't heal him, it would probably be within the next few weeks is what they said. So uh, please pray for Billy and for his family and all. But anyway, it's a, it's, it's a great, so, so Brian and I did that conference, and then we did a conference together at his, at his church, and then we did the, the one in New Zealand. It was funny because I hadn't put it together, but Brian said to me, do you realize that we've done three conferences in three countries in three weeks? And I said to him, uh, let's never do that again. So, um, <laughs> because we were both exhausted. But at New Zealand... I, God began to download on me about this spirit, what I've dealt with in this spirit and, and what this spirit tried to rob from me. And it was during worship. You know, we're having worship time. You've had this happen during worship. God's speaking to you. So he starts speaking things to me and I had a, a whole session planned. I was the next speaker and I just felt like the Lord said, I want you to share about this. So I got up and shared just what God was showing me and what I'd been experiencing for two years, you know, dealing with this thing. And um, when I sat down, Brian said to me, that is the single most important message I've ever heard a pastor share with pastors. Never heard anything like that in my life. And he said, you've got to develop that now so you can, you can help pastors with that. So the title of what I'm calling it is Stop Tolerating. And uh, I, I thought about all sorts of catchy titles, and um, I know that's not a catchy one, and you've seen I'm not that catchy, um, but that says best what I want to say, stop tolerating. Turn to Revelation chapter 2, and if you'll open to 1 Kings 19, if you'll put a marker there. So if you're opening your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2, uh, or... Um, um, Click on your iPhone to Revelation 2, however you read your Bible now, and then um, put a marker at 1 Kings chapter 19. There's an Old Testament person named Jezebel and a New Testament person named Jezebel, but there's a spirit that was behind both persons, and we're going to talk about that spirit. But these were actual people. Revelation 2 verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these things says the Son of God. I, I've gone through, by the way, I've read this passage over a hundred times. And everything keeps jumping off page at me that, that this is Jesus talking. Jesus is tell, trying to warn us about something. These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works. I want you to think about this, the compliment of this. To, to, he's saying this to many of you listening. I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. That's not a bad thing. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow now, that word in the old King James is tolerate. You tolerate, you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself, it's always a self-imposed position, 
who calls herself a prophetess. But you allow her, I'm just uh, putting that back in to help us remember the sentence, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Uh, can, let, me, let me stop just for a minute because I'm not sure this is, um, that I'll get to this later. But you remember in the Jerusalem Council, Acts 15, uh, when they were deciding whether Gentiles needed to become Jews once they got saved. And they, they decided, the early church fathers, that once we, I'm talking to me, I'm a Gentile, once a Gentile got saved, he did not have to become a Jew to, to be saved, to believe in Jesus, which I'm glad because I like uh, ribs and shrimp. Um, <laughs> by the way, let me just say, because we have a huge outreach to Jewish people here, if you're a Gentile church, you need to decide that a Jew can accept Yeshua and doesn't have to become a Gentile. He can remain a Jew and be saved because you remained a Gentile and got saved, okay? So you didn't have to be, uh, 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 adopt that. So, okay, so, all right. But they decided, though, they had to do four things. They, they had to stay away from sexual immorality, things strangled, things offered to idol, and things with the blood, Okay. Four things. Here's what Gentiles have to do. They have to stay away from sexual immorality. Okay, I want you to notice what Je Jezebel does. Who teaches the, my students, to my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. That covers all the other three. Things offered to idols, things strangled, things with the blood. That covers them all. That's exactly what Jezebel's trying to do. It's to try to get us to defile ourselves. Now, let me just explain. Sexual immorality defiles you inwardly, and these things defile you outwardly. The reason that the Jews uh, said this was that if a Gentile was eating something sacrificed to an idol or strangled in blood, he couldn't have fellowship with a Jew because it would defile a Jew. So what they were trying to say was, we don't want you to, sacri we don't want you to defile yourself with sexual immorality, but we also don't want you to defile yourself in a way that it affects our fellowship. That is exactly what the Jezebel spirit does. The Jezebel spirit tries to get me to defile myself in a way that disqualifies me either inwardly or outwardly for the ministry. Did you get that? I, I could have spent a lot more time on that, but um, uh, that's just something that God, God keeps unfolding his revelation to me. And I didn't have that in my notes, so I wanted to just mention that to you, all right? Verse 21, and I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed, watch very carefully, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. God is the judge. Now, this word, allow, he said, I want you to don't allow this anymore. That's what I'm, that's what I'm bothered by. You're allowing this. And again, again, old King James says tolerate. It means to, to um, uh, allow one to do as he wishes. To allow someone to do as he wishes. Here's the problem with the Jezebel spirit. We don't want to confront it because of what we'll get back. Now, I'm just giving you some, some generals, all right? Some uh, generalities here. If there's someone in your church that you dread confronting, it is very possible there's a spirit there. It is very possible. You dread either the over-the-top reaction you get, you will get, or the rejection, the withdrawal you will get. Either one. If you dread confronting, if you allow the person to do as he or she wishes, you may be tolerating a spirit that you should not tolerate. Now, Elijah stands up and, and addresses this spirit on Mount Carmel. But he addressed actually two spirits that many of us don't think of. And if you're going to talk about the Jeze Jezebel spirit, you have to talk about the Ahab spirit as well. A Jezebel spirit cannot operate without an Ahab spirit. Now, by the way, before you point fingers, okay, let me say this. Every person here has been affected by the Jezebel spirit at times and by the Ahab spirit at times. <laughs> Every one of us here have been controlling and have been controlled. So this is something that comes against all of us. But let me tell you some things about Ahab. Um, Ahab did a lot more than we think, and a lot of people have not really studied Ahab to, to understand this. 
If I were to ask you, and don't say it, some of you will know it, but some of you won't, and it might be embarrassing to you because you'd say the wrong answer. So let me just, who was the, the uh, king of Israel that conquered the most land? Now, before you say it, uh, it was not David. Most of us say David, David, you know, okay. It wasn't David, it was Solomon. Solomon conquered more land than any Jewish king. He was number one in conquering land. Who was number two? Not David. David was number three. Ahab was number two. Ahab conquered more land than any other king other than Solomon. Here's what that tells me. You can be a great conqueror and still be in bondage to the Jezebel spirit. This guy that conquered more land than any other king other than Solomon couldn't get a vineyard next door to his castle and went and laid in his bed and turned his face to the wall and put his bottom lip out. And Jezebel comes and gets it. And she gets it, by the way, through manipulation, intimidation, deception, lying, fear. That's the way she tried to to come against uh, 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 Elijah. Now, the Jezebel spirit can operate in a man or a woman. It is not gender biased at all. Okay. Matter of fact, there are many in instances in the Bible of the Jezebel spirit operating in a man. Uh, many. And I'm going to give you a couple, but let me give you one that all of you would know and, and know a lot about. Probably Herod the Great. Herod the Great uh, operated in the Jezebel spirit. Absolutely no doubt. Uh, he, he, it was manipulation. It was intimidation. It was insecurity. If it, let me give you the six things, the way to recognize the Jezebel spirit, by the way, insecurity and rejection. When you see insecurity and rejection, watch for this pride and arrogance, pride and arrogance, insecurity, rejection, pride and arrogance. And I have them in my notes and I now have forgotten the other two. So hopefully we'll get back to that in a minute. Insecurity, rejection, pride, arrogance. Oh, manipulation and control. Manipulation and control. You remember what Herod said? He said to the wise men, when you find him now, you come back and, and, and uh, tell me where he is so I can worship him too. No, so I can kill him. And you, by the way. Uh, Herod was always planning on killing the wise men. That's why he wanted them to come back. That's why the Bible tells us very clearly, then being divinely warned in a dream. They were warned because he was going to kill not only Jesus, but the witnesses. He is, he is a huge manipulator. Uh, he was extremely insecure. Watch for insecurity and rejection. He was insecure about everybody around him. He killed, uh, he'd see the servants talking and he'd kill him. He, listen to this. He, um, um, what is it when you, uh, I'm trying to get my mind to work this morning. What is it when you, when you, um, you, you um, banish someone? Okay. He banished or killed all of his wives, Herod. The, or in the early days, he banished them, and, and then later in his life, he just killed them. Matter of fact, it says that he killed, this is history now, his historical documents say, Josephus said, that he killed his favorite wife, although he admitted later to regretting it. <laughs> well, I think that's sweet of him. Uh, <laughs> he regretted killing her. By the way, she was a Jew, his favorite wife. And he killed her. But uh, he married her to get favor with the Jews. Her name was Miriam. He was always trying to get people under him and over him to like him. He was always manipulating. That's why, if, why he was called Herod the Great. Because he was great. He really was. He built a lot of things you can see to this day. By the way, there are five Herods in the Bible. Uh, Herod the Great, Herod Antipas, Herod Philip, Herod Agrippa I, Herod Agrippa II. You have to be careful... Uh, when you're preaching, because I made these mistakes too. You know, Herod, Paul is standing for Herod. You know, Herod tried to kill Jesus. And we say, now this is the same Jesus. Be careful, you know, but make sure you really do your study first. Because that was a um, few Herods later. But Herod was called Herod the Great um, because he built a lot of great things. Oh, let me tell you one more insecure thing Herod did. His favorite son, his favorite, again, son, who was everyone knew would, be, would take over when he died, he killed him five days before he died, knowing he was dying because he was so insecure. That's how we get Herod the Tetrarch. See, some of you might say, oh, you left out Herod the Tetrarch. Okay, Herod the Tetrarch is not a name. Tetrarch means a fourth. And the kingdom was divided into four sections, Tetrarchs. And so that's why you have Herod Tetrarch mentioned in Scripture. But it was actually Herod Philip that was one of those, okay? So, anyway... Uh, here's the three things he built you can see to this day. This is why he's called great. He built Caesarea. 
the, the harbor city of Caesarea. You can go to the ruins to this day. By the way, it was named Caesarea after Caesar because he's trying to manipulate. He's trying to get favor. Uh, he built uh, Masada, which is the finest desert spa ever built. It's much better. It, it, for that day, it would have been better than anything in Vegas that you could see. Uh, and he built, which a lot of people don't know this, he built the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall, where you see the Jews praying and where some of you have visited. Herod built that, and it's really just a retaining wall. He, he was expanding the Temple Mount, again, to gain favor with the Jews. So there's a spirit that operates in men and women. It is a manipulating, controlling, uh, insecure, jealous spirit. It comes out of insecurity and rejection, and it becomes manipulating and controlling. Uh, let me show you the effects, four effects. Here are my four points, all right, four points. The four effects of a Jezebel spirit, how you know a Jezebel spirit is affecting you. When you see this in you, it's possible it is a Jezebel spirit that's doing it, all right? Number one, fear. I thought it was very interesting that uh, Pastor Jimmy last night didn't know what I was ministering today. And uh, matter of fact, I told him afterward in the green room at the service, and he said, well, isn't that something? Because he said, when you called, when y'all called me to do this conference, God said to me immediately, he wanted me to talk about fear. So fear. Now, go to 1 Kings 19, if you had your Bibles there, or you can just flip back to it, you know, easily. 1 Kings 19, verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. You know, 1 Kings 18 is where he killed all the prophets of Baal uh, in the previous chapter. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Also, how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. This is Elijah. <laughs> this is the man of God that just called fire down from heaven and I really don't mean this in a wrong way, but a woman says he has just killed 850 men, actually, 450 prophets of Baal and, and 400 prophets of Ashtoreth. He's just killed 850 false prophets. And a woman says to him, I'm going to get you, and he runs. That's, that's fear. That is a spirit of fear. I want you to think about this. Do you get kind of quaky or shaky or nervous when you think about addressing one of your pastors or one of your elders or one of your deacons or someone in your church? That's not a person that's intimidating you. That's a spirit that's intimidating you. When I, when I um, uh, and I, I had to address this. I've gone through about a four-year process now doing this. But uh, uh, a after I addressed it and did what God told me to do, I was praying in the green room one day before one of the services, and uh, I, I nearly always take authority over the enemy. I hope you take authority over the enemy before your service. Now listen, this is why. Submit to God, resist the devil. So I'm always submitting to God. I nearly always get on my knees. I just did that. Uh, I normally always get on my knees before I preach. I pray in the Spirit, as I said. I submit my tongue to God. I submit myself to God. And then I stand and I resist the enemy, and I rebuke the enemy. Because there's a warfare going on. So I was doing that. I was resisting and rebuking the enemy uh, from the service, and it came in my mind, and all this, you know how it is, it happens just like this. The thought came in my mind, rebuke the Jezebel spirit. The next thought came in my mind was, I don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> Have you ever had thoughts like this? Because, you know, this is a strong spirit. That's why I thought, you know, this is a strong, I mean, do I, I, mean, I just fought the thing. Do I really want to, you know, call it out again, you know? That's what I was thinking, okay? And just like this, the Lord said to me, this is not a strong spirit. Just like that. He is not a strong spirit compared to me. Just like that. Compared to me, he's not strong. And then the Lord said to me, listen, you address spirits in my authority, son, not your authority. In your own authority, you couldn't even address a puny spirit. He said, now you stand up and you address this spirit in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want you to understand, if you have fear, it's a spirit. It's a spirit. You need to stand up and address that spirit of fear. 
and its power, listen, its power, the power of the Jezebel spirit, it has power because we tolerate it. When we stop tolerating it, it has no more power. It, this is a constant battle for people in authority. Please hear me. You say, well, I, 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 you know, I did this three years ago. Well, get ready to do it again. <laughs> because as long as you have authority, this spirit is going to try to attach itself to you through someone else constantly. Uh, it is rooted, as I said, in insecurity and rejection. When you study Jezebel, Jezebel was rejected by her father and had a controlling mother. Now listen to me carefully. This is a pattern that I've seen. Many people who have the Jezebel spirit feel rejected by the father and they have a dominant mother. Not all, but many that I've seen. Her father gave her to Ahab to form an alliance. She didn't want to be married to Ahab. She was like a piece of property. She felt rejected by her father and she became a very dominating person. People who have a Jezebel spirit have to control. They, have, they, they are so wounded that they don't want to be rejected, so they control every person and every circumstance around them. That's what they do. They'll try to control their family because they don't want their family to reject them. And you know what happens, don't you? The family ends up rejecting them. The, the thing they fear comes upon them. We would, we would call them control freaks. And so we would say, we'd say you, know, you, know, you know how she is. She's a control freak. Okay, it's very possible she actually has a very deep wound of rejection. She's trying to control everything around her so she won't feel rejected. That's what's happening. Um, there are several instances of this in the Bible, uh, but let me, let me say it this way. The most subtle way that the Jezebel spirit gets into a leader's life is through a friend. People who have this spirit want to be your best friend. They feel called, called to be your friend, um, called to minister to you, called to serve you. I'm just called to serve you. I'm called. God called me to serve you or to be your intercessor or to be your armor bearer. Now, I'm not saying that we don't need that, but I, you, if you will notice, I hope you do notice, I don't have a bunch of people running around here serving me. You won't see three or four people carrying my Bible and doing all this stuff. And you can do all your stuff at your armor bearer you want to do. I don't do it. I'm a human. You're a human. We got people working around here, but I don't need three or four boys running around me, taking care of me. You, you understand what I'm saying? But you've got you to watch out because people are, and, and listen, you've got to distinguish now between a person and a spirit. Some of these people are really good. They're good people. They really are. They don't even know that this spirit takes up residence through an open door of rejection in them. And that spirit takes up residence and begins trying to control you. You understand that the Jezebel spirit hates you, hates your church. And it's going to try to get to you very subtly. Now, I'm going to, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, let me, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and apologize. I'm sorry. I'm going to blow one of your sermon series right here. Um, I see the Jezebel spirit operating in Jonathan, Saul's son. It is so clear to me that I can't believe that other people haven't seen it. I really can't. You got to remember when I got saved, I didn't know the Bible. You know, it's a, um, um, Michael Jr. talked about Job last night. I, one of my friends got saved. He, he immediately read the book of Job because he needed one. <laughs> okay. So I didn't know the Bible. So I'm reading through the Bible. When I come to Jonathan and David, I immediately saw a snake in the grass. I didn't know that everybody preached series on this and used it as the ultimate example of friendship and covenant. But it was as clear as it could be. Saul finds David five times. Three of those times, only one guy knew where he was. It's incredible to me. And Jonathan says this. Look at this. You want to see the Jezebel spirit? Listen to what he says. Oh, wait, wait. Before I go to that, let me tell you. You say, say oh, yeah, but they made a covenant. Read the covenants. They are more one-sided than anything you've ever seen in your life. Matter of fact, they didn't just make one. Everybody said they made a covenant. They made three 
covenants. And every time he gets more and more, it is never Jonathan saying, I will protect you. And I will protect your family, your sins. Here's what he says. You promise to me that you won't harm me or my family or my descendants. Do you know why he said that? Because it was normal when a king came in from another family to kill all of the reigning family members. That's why Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son, when he, that's why he's living in Lo Debar. Lo Debar is not on the way to anywhere if you've ever been to Israel, okay? He is, he is living and he's scared to death. When he's called, he comes in and bows down and says, what am I such a dead dog that you call me? You know, he's, he thinks he's going to die because he's the last remaining descendant. So that's what John is doing. He's working both sides of the fence. I promise you. You just look. So let me, let me show you. Watch this. This will, I know you are, I can hear you already, you're mad because it, it <laughs> took away your series. But all right, look. Look at this verse, 1 Samuel 23, 17. This is Jonathan. And he said to him, do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. Now watch. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Even my father knows that. Whoever promised Jonathan the number two place? Huh? He knew David was the anointed leader. He knew David was probably going to kill Saul, but here's what he figured. If Saul kills David, I'll be king. If, if David kills Saul, I'll be number two. I'm going to keep both ends open. And, and you don't think David knew this? When David's running from Saul, one of these times he's running from Saul, let me read you what he wrote. Psalm 41, verse 6. And if he comes to see me, he's talking about Jonathan. If he comes to see me, he speaks lies. His heart gathers iniquity to itself, and when he goes out, he tells it. He goes and tells where I am. Watch verse 9. Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. In Psalm 55, he says, the guy that made a covenant with me, but let me read it to you out of the message. And this, my best friend, betrayed his best friend. His life betraying his word. Now, in the New King James, it says, broke our covenant. He broke our covenant. All of my life, I've been charmed by his speech, never dreaming he'd turn on me. And his words, which were music in my ears, turned to daggers in my heart. I'm sorry I ruined your series. I'm sorry. But I don't like that statement right there. I don't like anybody saying to me, Pastor Robert, I'm here to serve you, and you're the number one guy, and I'll be the number two. I'll serve you, and I'll, and I'll, I'll be your armor bearer. I'll be your, I don't, I don't need that. I need you to be his armor bearer. I need you to serve God, not me. The Spirit always wants to be next to the person in authority. Uh, here's number two, isolation. When you want to get away from everything and everybody, it's very possible. Now, and I'll explain in a moment a difference here because there's a good form too. 19, 1 Kings 19 verse 3 again. When he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Now, this is a very trusted person to Elijah. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. Okay, isolation. Let me tell you the difference between isolation and solitude. Solitude's a good thing. Jesus often withdrew to pray, to pray, to be with the Father. Solitude is getting alone with God. Isolation is getting alone with you. And you're not that cool to be alone with. <laughs> I, solitude is a good thing. I am a person of solitude. I am a person. I have to go to the mountain. I have to get alone with God. I have to be with God. I, I come down and, and basically give the law, and I got to go back up the mountain again and spend time with God. And all, everybody around here knows that. But what happens when the Jezebel spirit's attacking me, I don't go into solitude. I don't get alone with God. I just get alone with me. I just, I can't be around anybody. I don't want to be around anybody. I don't want anyone. I want to be alone. I want to uh, watch movies, eat potato chips and ice cream. That's what I want to do. And I did this and I began withdrawing and withdrawing and withdrawing. And the more I had to get away, I had to get out of our city limits because I could feel that spirit here. But I didn't know what it was until God, by in his grace, began to reveal it to me. Uh, you can remember also 
I, I'm not going to read it, but later in uh, 1 Kings 19, when he's complaining to God, he says, I alone am left. You feel like you're the only one. You feel like you're the only one. All right, number three is exhaustion. Exhaustion. Verse four, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. Now, uh, I went into the Hebrew and it really does back this up, but I want to read you that verse in the message. So you may just have to look at the screen. Uh, verse 4 in the message says, And then went on into the desert another day's journey. He came to a lone broom bush and collapsed in its shade. Collapsed. And then verse 5 in the message says, Exhausted. He fell asleep under the lone broom bush. Suddenly an angel shook him awake and said, Get up and eat. He looked around and to a surprise right by his head were a loaf of bread. That's the first angel food cake. baked on some coals and a jug of water. He ate the meal and went back to sleep. You want to know why? He was exhausted. He was exhausted. Can I just ask anyone here ever relate to this? Can I just see your hand? <laughs> exhausted. Now, we're going to talk about something else next, but I want to, I'm, we're going to talk about uh, wanting to die as well. But I just want to show you a verse because it's really good. Job 3, verse 11 Job said, why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? And verse 13 says, for now I would have lain still and been quiet. I would have been asleep. Then I would have been, have been at rest. Okay, listen to me. When you read the obituaries and think, lucky guy, At least he's finally getting some rest. <laughs> I wish my name were there because <laughs> I'd finally get some peace. Heaven looks really good to me when you're exhausted. I, I wanted the doctor to diagnose me with exhaustion. A lot of, you know, Brian talked about how I preached on Sabbath, and I believe in Sabbath. But as I look back on it, a lot of it came from me being so tired I was trying to tell people, rest, rest, rest. You got to rest. And now I feel like I am busier than I've ever been in my life. I'm doing conferences constantly, going to, but it is, it, it, it invigorates me. There's something totally different now. I don't have that spirit. And the reason that spirit had access into my life was because I tolerated it. As long as you tolerate it, it's going to affect you with all of these things that we're talking about. Um, if you're having problems sleeping, it might be a Jezebel spirit. Because that's what a Jezebel spirit does. When Elijah got away from it, he slept and slept and slept and slept. Let me ask you this. When you get out of town, do you sleep for hours? Just days, can't hardly wake up. And when you drive back into the city limits where you minister, do you feel the oppression? you got to break through. You can't tolerate it. God did not design us to have to sleep by sleeping pills. It was not his desire for you. Uh, here's number four, depression. These are symptoms, sir. Signs of a Jezebel, causes of it. Not causes, but effects. Verse 4 says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. And said, It is enough now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. This prayer to die, I found in the Bible, is common to leaders. Many leaders prayed to die. Read just a few. Moses, verse 15. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. <laughs> what a prayer. If you like me, kill me. Uh, Jeremiah 20, verse 14 and 15. Listen to Jeremiah the prophet. Cursed be the day which I was born. Let the day not be blessed in which my mother bore me. Let the man be cursed who brought news to my father saying a male child has been born to you. <laughs> He's cursing everybody <laughs> and everything about life. 
Jonah 4, 3, therefore now, Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Listen to me carefully. Thoughts of suicide are evidence of a Jezebel spirit. I never entertained suicide in my life. Still haven't entertained it, but I had the most bombarding thoughts when I fought this spirit. I, I, just have a, I would have a thought like this. This is just unbelievable. I would have a thought like, you know, you and Debbie had a good day and you talked to all the kids on the phone today. Today would be a good day. I would reject it, obviously, stand against it, and not have, have a desire to. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that's a demonic spirit t- telling me how I can get out. Thoughts of, of suicide. Here's another one. Listen, relating to commercials on television about depression. You ever seen those commercials? Are you depressed? Well, I am now after watching this. Good gosh, that's a good commercial for that medicine. What, honey, what was the name of that medicine they... Thoughts of suicide, thoughts of depression. Let me give you one more under this. Thoughts of quitting. Debbie and I had a conversation one night where we outlined my exit from Gateway Church. I was tired of it. I was tired of fighting. Out, outlined it. So, well, we could do this. We'll say we'll stay up to a year. We'll help them find another pastor. We'll da, da, da. Well, I'm going through. This is my dream. I founded it. It's what God called me to do. The spirit... I don't want to be, a, I can't do it. I can't, you know, I, I saw, so we outline my exit strategy. The next morning I get up, thank God for quiet times, faithful, went in to have my quiet time and the Lord, I mean, I can't even, I don't, I mean, I sit down in the chair and the Lord says, uh, now I don't know why, but he begins a lot of sentences with, uh, with me. <laughs> have you ever, uh, like that? And here's what he said. He said, um, I did not authorize that conversation last night. Just like that. I did not authorize that conversation. Okay. That day and the next day, uh, Jimmy Evans, Jack Hayford, and James Robson, all three called me in the next two days and said, what's going on? What's going on? And I remember when I was talking to Pastor Jack, I said, Pastor Jack, I told him about this. And, of course, we kind of laughed. And he said, yeah, I've had lots of conversations God did not authorize. (laughs) And then he got kind of serious, and he said, Robert, I'm mad. Just like that. He said, I'm mad. He said, it, it angers me that you've come to such a place to think about quitting what God called you to do. And he said, you're going to have to deal with this. I want you to deal with it. And he and Jimmy Evans and James Robinson Help me, and then I went obviously to the elders of the church and had already been talking to them, but that's where the apostolic eldership came in. They came in to set things in order. They said, this is, this is a spirit. Jack Hafer gave me some of the best advice. I want you to listen to this advice. He said, you can be gracious with the person. You can't be gracious with the spirit. You can be gracious with the person, but you can't be gracious with the spirit. So we begin to deal with it. Before I tell you how I dealt with it, I need to tell you one other thing. Um, I've told you um, suicidal thoughts are an indication. Depression is an indication. Uh, thoughts of quitting or resigning are an indication. Let me give you one, another indication here. I know this is all under depression, but it's just how I have it in my notes. Um, impure, sexually impure thoughts are an indication of a Jezebel spirit. I have a very immoral background. I've shared very openly, had a moral failure in my 20s, had to step out of ministry, get my life straight. That's over 28 years ago now. Uh, 24 years ago I stepped out, 28 years ago that it happened. Um, but uh, So I have, I have this immoral past, but God set me free. And that's why I'm so big on healed and set free, because I was saved and I loved Jesus, but I wasn't healed and set free and, and it doesn't matter whether you're in ministry or not. If you're in bondage, you're in bondage. 
So I'm real big on that. But I've walked in freedom for years. When I began to deal with this, the impure thoughts were like the suicide. They were just unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And I was very accountable to Debbie. I was very accountable to the elders of the church. Never fell, never looked at pornography, never did anything like that, but just bombarded, bombarded with this stuff. And uh, let me uh, read you. If you, go, you don't have to go back to that, but Revelation 2. Well, it just says about who teach my servants to commit sexual immorality. So if you're struggling at all in the area of sexual impurity, you, you may have a Jezebel spirit that's gotten close to you and has an inroad. By the way, the people who operate in this manipulate mainly through guilt. They make you feel guilty. They say things like, you know, you're rejecting me just like everyone else has. You're rejecting me just like everyone else has. Oh, I, oh, I know why I was going to read that uh, in chapter 20, but we read it before. I mean, chapter 2, verses 20 through 22 of Revelation, but we read it before. He said, I will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her. Let me give you another sign of a, and this is, I had four points, and I know I'm giving you a lot more stuff, but let me give you another sign of it. Strange and prolonged sicknesses. Strange and prolonged sicknesses. I started having sinus infections like you wouldn't believe. I said to the Lord, Lord, why would my sinuses, why, am, why are they so infected all the time? He says really clearly to me, you know, everything in Scripture represents all the five senses. This, this is a great sermon series, by the way. All the five senses represent something spiritual. Touch, sight, spiritual sight, spiritual hearing, spiritual ears, taste, uh, smell. Smell represents discernment. This is what the Lord said to me. He said, your discernment, your spiritual sinuses are infected. So your physical sinuses are infected. They're infected. Because you just, you, you keep going past your discernment. You know it's wrong, but you just keep allowing it. You tolerate it. You tolerate it. You allow it. Strange and prolonged sicknesses. And one other thing that, that I saw through this was bizarre and near tragic accidents. Bizarre and, and near tragic, or uh, um, another way to say that, uh, let's see how I wrote that down, how I said it. Oh, fatal, nearly fatal accidents. I had several accidents that were just bizarre. Now, let me tell you why. Not the person. The person wasn't trying to kill me, but the spirit was. And we know that. We have spiritual proof. Spirit is trying to steal, kill, and destroy. And I'm going to say something that I, this morning when I was going over my notes, I thought everyone's going to want to write this down. I don't know if you can write this fast, so you may have to get the CD. Steal, kill, and destroy. This, the Jezebel spirit tries to steal your peace, joy, and confidence. It tries to steal your peace, joy, and confidence. It tries to kill you with sickness and accidents. It tries to kill you with sickness and accidents, and it's trying to destroy you with depression and fear. It's trying to steal your peace, joy, and confidence. It's trying to kill you with sickness and accidents. And it's trying to destroy you with depression and fear. So what's the answer? The answer is you address it in the person and remove him or her from all leadership unless he or she repents. If the person will repent then the person can continue to minister or whatever and go through a process. But if the person won't repent, you must remove that person from all authority. And uh, this is going to, this may be sound kind of tough, but you have to remove that person from any personal influence with you. You can't remain friends with a person that won't be humble and teachable. You can't. There's no way because that spirit will affect you. Uh, if you go on down in 1 Kings 19, uh, and I've got about five more minutes, so I'm a little over here, but uh, if you'll bear with me. Um, if you go on down to 1 Kings 19, you know the, the uh, wind, uh, the, the um, fire, and the earthquake, and the still small voice. The wind represents, uh, re obviously represents the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit began to give me words of knowledge to confirm that this was a spirit. 
I begin to ask the person specific questions to confirm that this was a spirit there. One of the questions that the Lord gave me was, I said, do you feel called by God to walk beside me to keep me from screwing up? And the person said, oh, yeah, that's exactly what God called me to do. I think about that. That called by God to walk beside me to keep me from screwing up. And I said, do you realize how that makes me feel? That if it wasn't for you, I'd screw up? I mean, nothing to do with the Holy Spirit or God or even my own integrity in, in ministry. So words of uh, wisdom, so the wind, the fire begin to purge. I don't have time to go into all this. The, the earthquake, God begins to shake everything in your life. The still small voice, God begins to speak to you. Remember, he speaks through his voice. My sheep hear my voice. God is not mute. He didn't quit speaking 2,000 years ago. He speaks through his voice, his word, counsel, and peace. Those are the four major ways God speaks. His voice, uh, his word, counsel, through counsel of godly people around you, and the key word there is godly, <laughs> and peace, that you have peace in your heart. I begin to seek counsel. You remember Elijah said, I'm the only one left? God said, I got 7,000 others, dude. Okay, I began to seek godly counsel from the elders and the apostolic elders and other senior pastors. It was amazing how many other pastors had gone through this. Now, uh, here's the last thing. After he deals with this, he is told to anoint three people. Uh, Hazel, uh, Jehu, and Elisha. Uh, Hazel, Jehu, and Elisha. And here's what I think that he was told to do. The way you deal with the spirit is... Uh, a prophet, a priest, and a king. <laughs> a prophet, a priest, and a king. In this instance, Hazel obviously was the king. I think Elisha was the priest for the people of God. And I think Jehu operated as the prophet because Jehu's the one that killed Jezebel, actually. Said, throw her down and trampled her under her foot. So, but let me remind you, all of us know this, Jesus is the prophet, the priest, and the king. Now, Jesus says in Revelation 2, if you don't deal with this, I'm going to deal with you. And listen to me very carefully. This is what the Lord showed me. If you don't deal with this, because those who sleep with her are judged too. If you don't deal with this, listen, he will remove you if you will not remove her. He will raise up someone else who will stand against the Spirit and he will raise up someone else to carry your ministry who has double the anointing. That's what I feel. This is the prophet, the priest, and the king. He will remove you if you will not remove her because he's the king who judges all. He'll raise up someone else who will stand against the spirit. He'll raise up another priest in your, your place. And he'll raise up someone else to carry the ministry, another prophet who has twice the anointing. Uh, okay, here, here are the three practical things, and I just have to say them, to deal with it. Get with God, seek counsel, and take action. Get with God. You have to get a word from God on this. Seek counsel, and then take action. And let me tell you what happened as I began to deal with this. We were in the process of building this building. Uh, it's a very expensive building. It's in, we built it in the midst of, we began our capital campaign. We took commitments, three-year commitments, when the president in October of 08 said, we're in the worst recession of our lifetime. And the next Sunday was Commitment Sunday. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> I remember even saying to God, I said, God, you're the one that led us a year ago to do it this month, October of 08. Surely you you know, would have seen the headlines before <laughs> and known this. And here's what the Lord said to me. He said, I'm planning it right when I want it to because I'm going to get the glory for building that building. I'll get the glory for it. So um, anyway, because of that, we had banks lined up to, to, to give us money. We, we give a lot of money away, but we live way below our means. You know, like one year, our, our budget was 18 million. Our income was 24. One year our budget was 24, our income was 34. One year our budget was 35, our income was 50. So we, we, we live way below our means. So the banks, we had money in the bank. We'd already spent almost $20 million on the property. We had, okay, we were okay financially. That's what I'm trying to tell you, all right? 
but the banks, the federal regulators came in and shut them down. The banks were lending way over their limits. And so all of a sudden the banks were like, well, we want to help, but we can't, we can't do it. We can't give you, we can't give you that much money. Total land fees, everything's about a hundred million dollars. Okay. That's big to anybody. I don't care how big your church is. That's big. Okay. So the banks said, we can't do it. We, we just can't do it. You, we, you've got to do this. You got to do this. You got to, so all these things, we're going through all this stuff. We've had our groundbreaking ceremony. We had our groundbreaking ceremony. We got dozers out here. We're using the money in the bank. We don't have the, we don't have the loan papers. We don't have the loans. And so I'm praying all this time I'm dealing with this. Finally, it comes down to that the, we still need $20 million because the banks wanted, we had all this commitments. We had almost $50 million in commitments and we'd already had all this cash done, but the bank wanted all this lined up in case the commitments didn't come through. Because they'd done stuff with other churches where people make commitments, the commitments didn't come in. And they really didn't understand our giving track record. Our people have given, and I'm grateful for that. So anyway, they, they, they came down there, we needed $20 million more. All this time I'm dealing with this spirit. Okay, a spirit, now not a person. Even though I did deal with, deal with a person, I'm dealing with a spirit. So one morning, I'm, Jack told me how to deal with it. Pastor Jack. So I'm over here at Grapevine Lake and I'm on the shore of the lake and I'm writing this where I have to deal with the person putting it in, but I'm, I'm cutting off the spirit. And I know that I'm finally, we've given time to repent, no repentance. We're dealing with it. So when I finish, I go to close my laptop and I get that thing before the lid closes. It's like, no, 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 no. Pray over it. So I open the lid back up just in symbolic gesture and I begin to pray. Well, it's one of those prayer times I looked at the clock as I began to pray, and it was 1046 in the morning. I just saw that, and I began to pray, and I began to pray, and I began to pray. And pretty soon, I'm, I'm in my vehicle all by myself. There was no one parked around me because it was um, cold at the lake. It wasn't the summer, so I'm the only one parked on the shore. It's probably a good thing. And so pretty soon, I'm shouting. I am tearing down this stronghold, this principality and power over this area, over the church. I'm breaking, I'm, I'm just, you know, you've had these times. I mean, I'm shouting. My voice is sore. I'm shouting. I'm crying. I'm repenting for tolerating this. God, please forgive me. Forgive the church. Remove the curse that I brought on the church for tolerating this in our leadership, God. And I'm, I am praying and I'm, okay, when I finished, it, I, I'm, I'm shouting now, hallelujah, hallelujah. I feel it. It's broken. I know it's broken. I, I still got to deliver the letter, handle all the junk, but it's done. It's done in the spirit. You, are y'all, you, are you following me? I'm shouting, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm just excited. It's just unbelievable. I look at the clock. It's 1146, 60 minutes, one hour. And I thought, oh, thank you, God. Thank you, God. I just can't believe it. it's done. Okay. The phone rings. Right then, the phone rings. I pick the phone up. It's a member of our church. And he says to me, Robert, do we have all the finances for the church, for the new building? Do we have all the loans that we need? And I said, no, actually we don't. I didn't say, that's all I said. He said, well, my wife and I were praying, and we would like to loan the church $20 million. A, a person, a family in our church, he didn't know the bank said, you need $20 million. And it happened after I dealt with this. The minute I dealt with it, it happened. And I wonder what's being held up in your church and in your ministry and in your life because you're tolerating a spirit. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you are dealing with with this right now and you know that you need to deal with it I want you to stand up so I can pray for you okay
Okay, the first thing I want you to do is pray. And I don't want you to pray out loud. I want you to be able to, to just pray, just have a moment with God. But I need you to repent for tolerating it. I need you to just talk to the Lord for a moment by yourself and just say, Lord, I ask you to forgive me. Please forgive me for tolerating this in your church. And tell him anything else you need to tell him. Lord, I want to tell you, thank you that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just, justified. You're the only one justified. You're the only one who has the justice to be able to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, I, I, don't, I, I admit, I don't fully understand this scripture. I think I have some revelation, but I don't fully understand it. But Lord, you said to the disciples, to whom sins you forgive, they're forgiven. So, Lord, I, I feel like that means we just come into agreement with heaven. And I come into agreement right now, and I say to my brothers and sisters, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. You're released. And now, Lord, I ask you to give us wisdom. Give us the plan of how to move forward. What to do, what to say. Lord, I pray every person here now would get with you, would get on the mountain, would feel the wind, the earthquake, and the fire, and would hear the still, small voice. And, Lord, we submit ourselves to you. And we resist Satan. And in the name of Jesus, I take authority over every demonic spirit that's coming against my brothers and sisters in Jesus' name. And I rebuke it right now in Jesus' name. (laughs) Not in my authority, but in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name, the blood, and the power of the Lamb, I rebuke Satan. Every spirit of rejection, every spirit of fear, every spirit of intimidation, every spirit of manipulation, every spirit of control, in Jesus' name, I say go. Go in Jesus' name. Right now, go in Jesus' name. And Lord, I want to tell you, thank you, thank you, thank you for a breakthrough in every person's life that's standing and every ministry that's represented we tell you thank you for the breakthrough in Jesus name amen let's thank the Lord thank you Lord thank you Lord Okay, you can be seated. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor Ed. It'll just be a one moment and we'll release you. But I want to say to you, thank you for coming. We love you guys. We, we are sisters and brothers in Christ. Any way we can help you, we get joy out of helping other churches. Um, we're, we, you know, we're not the best church, but we're one of the churches. Uh, and we just want to help you. So any way we can help you. Let us help you. We love you guys.